mercy for mankind You are the teacher for this life Allah has blessed you with the Quran Rasul Muhammad Oh alayhi wa sallam You're Allah's chosen one Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this episode of Stories from the Sunnah here on Huda TV I'm your brother Abdurrahim McCarthy In today's episode we're going to be focusing on a hadith in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saw a man wearing a golden ring. As Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw this man wearing the golden ring and he took it off of him and he threw it down. And he said, one of you is wishing live coal from hell and putting it on his hand. Upon seeing this, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had went away, one of the Sahaba said to this Sahabi, why don't you take it, the ring, as it's there on the ground, been thrown down, take it and benefit from it, sell it. I mean, you can't wear it obviously now, but at least sell it, benefit from it. The Sahabi, who was the owner of the ring, he said, no by Allah, I would never take it when Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has thrown it away. Subhanallah. What do we gain from this story? What does this story teach us? First of all, right away, we see that clearly it's haram for men to wear gold. The Prophet ﷺ became angry seeing this. He took it himself off the hand of the man and he threw it away. All of this clearly shows us that it's haram. And he said on top of that, do you wish to have live coal from hell and put it onto your hand? So clearly we see this is something major, not something light, and it's something haram. And there are several hadith where the Prophet ﷺ has clearly warned about wearing gold for men. In one hadith he said, ha inna hadaini haram ala ummati. He said that these two are haram on the men of my ummah, and he showed the silk and the gold. The silk and the gold. So clearly we know from this hadith that silk and gold are haram for men. When the Prophet said these are haram on the dhukur, on the males, the men of my ummah, we know that it's halal for the women. So it's halal for women to wear gold, and it's halal for women to wear silk, but it's haram for men to wear silk. The Prophet وسلم, and I want you to pay attention to this hadith, it's very serious in showing the reality of wearing gold or silk for men in Islam. The Prophet وسلم, in this hadith is in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed. And Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned it in the Salsala al-Sahiha. He said, Man kan yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir, fa la yalbisu hariran wa la dhahaba. That whoever believes in Allah in the last day, then he should not wear silk or gold. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day should not wear gold or silk. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it came in another hadith, in Sunan al-Nasai, from the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a visitor, a man came to him from the area of Najran and when he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet sallam turned away and wouldn't pay attention to him which is not obviously the custom of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when people would come from far away he would pay close attention to them he would always have respect for them he would always honor them as his guest and here this person is coming from Najran which is all the way in the south, very far away and here he's coming and the Prophet is turning away from him. And he said, alayhi salatu wasalam, why? Because he had a gold ring on as well. And he said, you come to me with this piece of the hellfire or the coal from the hellfire on your hand. All of these hadith are very clear, my dear brothers, that it's haram for us as men to wear gold or to wear silk. The question comes is, why? What is the wisdom behind this? Why can women wear it and why can't men wear it? What is the wisdom? There's several things behind it. It's enough for us the fact that the Prophet ﷺ forbid us. 
it's very important as Muslims that we always know that the fact that Allah or His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to do something or told us to leave something, that's enough. We don't need to re- actually know why. It's enough because we know that Allah never orders something or forbids something or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never orders something or forbids something except for it has benefit in it for us, whether we understand it or not. So it, that in itself is enough. However, there's several wisdoms behind that. From that is that these things, the silk and the gold, that these are things that you, you'll find it, the people who are attached to the dunya sometimes, it's not a manly thing. It's more of a feminine type thing. It's a soft thing. You see the silk is very soft and nice, and that's not very manly for a man. For a woman, yes, it's, it's suitable for her. For a woman to beautify herself with gold uh, for her husband, that's very su- it's suitable for her. But for the man, it's not suitable. It's not something that's from the manly nature. And it's very important that we as men in Islam understand the reality of the rujula, of being men. And that's why several things, if you really reflect on it, understand why. Why does a man have a beard in Islam? Why is the beard fard compulsory in Islam? Obviously, once again, it's the command of the Prophet wasallam who forbid for us to shave the beards. And that's why we have the beard because it's from his sunnah that he commanded us to do the sunnah this wajib compulsory upon us that we must do as Muslim men. But also it's a sign of rajula. It's a sign of being a man. A man has a beard, a woman doesn't have a beard. Therefore the man who shaves his beard is imitating women. So these types of things, if we look at it, it's a reminder to us that we, the, the importance of the rajula and being manly. So these are some of the reasons why we don't wear gold and we don't wear silver and these type of things to have us attached to the, to the dunya. And the man in, in, in his nature in general, he's rough. And the lifestyle we live as men, it has to be rough. You have to be tough to be a true man and be able to survive in this world. You have to go to the battlefield. You go to the battlefield with some silk on, you go to the battlefield with some gold on, it doesn't work. Huh? And when you go out and you work to make a living, you have to go out and sweat and work in the sun. You can go out with your, 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 your silk and your gold. It's, it's not suitable. But the woman, she's in the house, she's you know, beautifying herself like this then it's, it's something that's very suitable for her. That's why it was permissible for the women and not permissible for the men. That's some of the reasons. From the things that we gain from this story, we benefit as well, not just the fact that this is haram, but if we, 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 the stories we're talking about, it's very important that we always reflect on all parts of the story. Because a lot of times, when we look at these stories, <clears throat> a lot of times we just take from it that which is clear from the benefit. So if we mention this story, we say, okay, that's clear that gold is haram. And then basically we stop there. Gold is haram for men, and we stop there. But let's, let's reflect deeper. What else can we benefit? That's, 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 what, that's, what, that's the objective of this series here, the stories from the Sunnah. We're reflecting and going deeper into these stories, the things that we benefit. If you look at one of the great things we benefit from this story, that we see how the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, the respect and how they strove to follow the command of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and refused to go against the sunnah alayhi salatu wa sallam. If you look, subhanAllah, in this story, at the end of the story, when the sahabi came to him and said, why don't you take the golden ring which has been thrown down there, take it and go and sell it, which, by the way, is permissible because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't make it harm for him to sell it, it's harm for him to wear it. So I could take this ring, I could sell it. I wouldn't sell it to another Muslim. Maybe I could have it crushed and put into a gold coin or a gold piece and sell that gold piece or something like that. So he, you can benefit from that. That's halal. There's no problem with that. However, for you to wear it, it's haram. But the Sahabi, because the fact that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam threw it down, he said, no, by Allah, I would never take it when the Lord's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has thrown it away. This shows us how they looked at the command of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's a great reminder to us about the importance of following the command of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, we need to constantly remind ourselves when we hear something from the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it's not optional. Just like it's not optional when you hear the command from Allah. Allah says, do this, stay away from that. It's not optional for you as a believer. The, the same thing, when the Prophet says, do this, stay away from that, it's not optional. How do we know it's not optional? Because Allah told us in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us 
in Surah Al-Ahzab. وَمَا كَانَ لِي مُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا That it's not up to a believing man or a believing woman. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the believing man and believing woman, as the scholars mentioned, this shows you that something very, very important you need to focus on. Because if Allah said the mu'mineen or the mu'min, the woman, she comes into that category as well. It's general. But when both of them come, it means it's extra important. You really need to pay attention. It's not up to a believing man or a believing woman. When Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair. Is it clear to you now? It's not up to the believing man or woman if Allah and His Messenger have decided a matter that they should therefore have any choice about their affair. Khalas. Since the law said do it, you have no choice. The Prophet said do it, you have no choice. Stay away from it, no choice, no choice. And pay attention to the end of the ayah. Because people say now, what do you mean no choice? Because we have free will. Don't misunderstand it like that. Meaning, yeah, you have free will. You can either say yes or no. You can either do it or you can leave it. But... When we say you don't have the option, as Allah clearly said here in, in this ayah, you don't have the option, meaning that you're going to be held accountable for Yom Al-Qiyamah. So you're not going to get away. If you refuse to obey, you're going to be held accountable. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said at the end of the verse, and pay attention, وَمَن يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مبينا. That whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger, then he has clearly gone astray. Balala uh, Mubina, an astrayness that is very, very clear. When you disobey Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's a sign that you have gone astray. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and safeguard us. And the other verse in Surah Al Nisa, when it comes to obeying our beloved Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah said, Fala wa rabbika la yu'minuna, hatta yuhakimuka fi ma shajara baynahum. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجَ مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا This verse shows us what it means to be a true Muslim when it comes to following our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I want you to pay close attention to this verse with me. In Surah An-Nisa, in verse 65, when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ But know by your Lord they will not truly believe. And that beginning, that, the introduction to the verse right there is very heavy. If you believe in Allah in the last day, hearing this from Allah when He swears by Himself, فَلَا وَرَبِّكْ But know by your Lord that you do not truly believe this is something serious. What do I have to do to truly believe? Until they go back to you, O Muhammad, to judge concerning over that which they dispute amongst themselves. This is the first thing. You cannot be a true believer unless you truly come back to the Prophet and rule by his sunnah. You rule by his sunnah, this is the first thing that makes you a true believer. And there's some other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the verse. We're going to cover them. But after this short break, stay tuned. We'll be right back, inshallah. Just know Allah won't let you lose your way. You are the mercy for me. You are the mercy for mankind. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulil Ameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Welcome back to this episode of Stories from the Sunnah here on Huda TV. I'm your brother, Abdurrahim McCarthy. Before the break, we were talking about the verse in Surah An-Nisa, verse 65, that shows what it means to be a true believer. And the only way that we can be true believers when it comes to following the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah made it very clear in the beginning of the verse, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And know, by, but know by your Lord, they will not truly believe. Hatta, until. 
Now, after what comes after this, we have to pay close attention to it because what it means for me to be a true believer and I have to have, what is the criteria? It's coming now in, 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 the, in the verse. Hatta yuhakkimuka fi ma The first thing is that we go back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for him to judge concerning over that which we dispute. We go back to his hukum. We go back to the ruling of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah. So we're true believers. We're going to go back <clears throat> to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we're going to see what did he say. We want to know what is right, what is wrong. Which direction to go in life? What is halal? What is haram? We have a business. We have something we want to do and accomplish. We have to go and look. What, is, what does Allah say in the Quran? And what does the Prophet ﷺ say in the Sunnah? Is this, is this halal for me to do? Is it haram? So the first thing is that we go back to his ruling. We see if he says halal or haram alayhi salatu was salam. Then what? ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِّمَّا قَضَيْتِ And then, it's not just enough to go back to the ruling. We have to go back to the ruling, and then we have to not have anything in our hearts about, or no discomfort about the judgment, the ruling that the Prophet ﷺ passed. Something, we really want to do it. We found it was haram. So we don't find anything in our hearts. And Allah says at the end of the verse, وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا and then they submit in full willing submission. They submit in full willing submission. They go back to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to look for the ruling. Then they don't find anything in their hearts if it goes against what their nafs desires. And then after that, they submit the full willing submission. These three things, all of them must be met if you're going to be a true believer in the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And that which he has ruled, and that which he has ordered, alayhi salatu was salam. We go and we search for it. We find it. Then, alhamdulillah, even if it's something we didn't want. Well, like, for example, we're in this hadith now, and we don't know much about Islam. We're ignorant, maybe. We didn't know that, that gold and silk was, was haram. Or maybe some of our brothers, may Allah uh, guide us and guide them, they've been into uh, this type of thing where they're, they're following the, the pop culture or the, 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 these rappers and what have you, and you'll find the brother has some gold chains, Brother has a golden earring and like this, and you know he thinks it's cool, and then he starts to practice his deen a little bit, and he hears it's haram. He said, "No, man, I, I, my gold chains. It can't be haram. I love my gold chains." So yeah, it's haram. He goes back to the Sunnah of the Prophet and sees it's very clear that it's haram. He went and he searched for the truth from the Prophet ﷺ. He found it, and then he says, "Alhamdulillah, it's haram. I have nothing in my heart, even though I want it, even though I like it. I'm not going to have anything in my heart, and I'm going to fully submit." to the command of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what it means to be a true believer in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We also benefit and we gain from this story how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would give reminders. He would gather with his companions. He would sit with his companions alayhi salatu wa sallam. And how the Sahaba themselves would come and want to learn from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would gather around the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to try to learn. And it's very important for us to constantly revive this sunnah in our centers, in our masajid around the world, that the imam and those in charge are constantly teaching the people. Even if it's something small. We read one hadith from Riyadh al-Salihin. We read something from the seer or we read something from tafsir ibn Kathir, a book in Aqidah. We read after the prayers once, twice a day, not to do it too much, but at least have it once or twice a day in the, in the masjid where it's a reminder to the people. And the people, when they hear these lessons, that they sit and they benefit and they learn their deen. Not in a hurry, like the Sahaba, to want to learn their deen and to benefit. Also, one of the things that we learn and we gain from this story is the issue of the munkir. And that which is evil, not letting it slide. Not letting it slide. The Prophet ﷺ, when he saw this man with the golden ring on his finger, he didn't let it slide. He didn't say, let me talk to him later. Let me not say anything. Maybe... Uh, he'll be offended. I'm not going to say anything to him. And it's very important that we realize this because many of the times now, the munkir, the evil things that have spread throughout the Muslim society, why does it spread? Because people were too shy to make inkar of munkir. You see, he sees his friend, he sees his brother, he sees one of the community members doing something that's haram, and he doesn't advise him. And what happens, as we know from the sunnah as well, when we don't advise like this, that eventually... The munkar is going to spread and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish all of us. I'm going to mention shortly an amazing story about that. 
Also, we know from the sunnah is the different levels of removing the munkar. The different levels of removing the munkar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us how to remove the munkar. Man ra minkum munkaran. Whoever sees from you the munkar. This is a command from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we don't follow this command, we're going to be from the losers. And that's why the ummah is in the situation is because we're not standing up against the munkar. We let it spread. And so it's become so widespread in many societies that the haram is the norm. And if you were to come say something to somebody, you would be the, the weirdo, you'd be the stranger. Subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man ra'a minkum munkaran, fal yughayruhu biyadih. Whoever sees munkar, then let him change it with his hand. فَمَنْ لَمْ اسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِ And whoever can't do it with his hand, then let him do it with his tongue. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ And if he can't do it, then let him do it with his heart. And if he can't do it then, then what does he do? That's the last level. That he said, That's the weakest level of faith. That is the weakest level of faith. Whoever sees it, let him change it with his hand. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ did in this story. He changed it with his hand. He didn't let it slide, and he removed the, he removed the, uh, the ring himself from, from the hand of the, of the Sahabi. He, he removed the munkah with his hand. But it's very important to realize who has the ability to do this. Is it something you can take now? You can, we, can, we can sit down and we're taking our notes here now. As we said, if we want to benefit from what's on the TV... Not just to sit back with our remote, but to take some notes and benefit. So it's okay, now we should remove the munkar with our hands. Can we go out in the street now and just forcibly remove the munkar from the people? What's going to happen? It's going to make up more harm than good, isn't it? You might get into a fight. You might end up going to jail. Maybe the person might harm you. And what's going to be even worse is sometimes when you do it with your hand like this, to somebody you don't know or you don't have the ability to do it with your hand, that you can make them hold on even worse to that munkar. So you have to use hikmah, you have to use wisdom when you remove it. How can you remove it with your hand if you're somebody of authority? You're somebody of authority. Or you have a certain status in the society within your community that if you were to do it, nobody would say anything to you. Or they wouldn't have anything and it wouldn't cause any problems between you and them. Because you have that status in society. Maybe somebody who's a well-respected imam, if he saw and he took the necklace off the brother, what would happen? The brother wouldn't say anything because of his, his status. Maybe he was just a regular imam. Maybe he might, might smack him or something. He doesn't, he doesn't really know who he is. But it was like the, you know, somebody, a big scholar in the city that people know and respect, and he has the ability to do that, he could do that. If it's the ruler, the hakim, or the emir of that country, he has the, the ability to remove with his hand, he does that. Or the man in his household. You see one of your children doing something, you can stop it with your hand. You can stay, you, if, you see, if, you, if your son comes home with a necklace, what are you going to do? You can rip it off. That's your right to do it, isn't it? So here in this situation, you can remove the, the munkar with your hand, you do it. After that, then you're with your tongue. And this is what we need to be really careful about, is to constantly, always try to make inkar of the munkar with the tongue. And there's different ways we can do it. And what's really important, my dear brothers and sisters, is this level of removing the munkar when it comes to the... Uh, the tongue and using the tongue to remove the munkar, something all of us should do, but we need to have wisdom, have hikmah, know how the, because what, what is the objective? When we come and remove the munkar, we want it to be removed, first of all, that's the first objective, and secondly, we want guidance for the people. Our objective is the hidayah for the people, that they're guided. Therefore, we need to use hikmah, use wisdom, know which words you, to use, know, know which words not to use, know the timings, Knowing that if you advise this person openly, it might make him hold on to the munkar even worse. And if you advise somebody else privately, it's good for him. Or sometimes, when you, if you're somebody of authority, if you do it openly and advise, it's going to be dawah for other people. Sometimes, for example, in my community, in my masjid, maybe I'll see a brother doing something, and I'll tell him like a, in a joking way. I'll tell him in a nice way, Yaqe, we don't know this is haram, we shouldn't be wearing it, brother, you know, and I'm nice to him. But what am I doing at the same time? I'm letting the other brothers hear it. Yaqi, you're wearing a necklace. That's haram, yaqi. We didn't know it was haram. We forgot, astaghfirullah, because only women wear necklaces in Islam. Men don't wear necklaces. He said, brother, it's silver. 
I said silver is permissible for the ring, but not for the necklace, because this falls into the image. There's a, a very important issue about other types of jewelry. We'll talk about that in, in a minute, inshallah. So the second level is with the tongue. And the third level, which is the weakest one, and this is the one you must have. If you don't have this one, you really need to check yourself out because it's a problem. It's a serious problem if you, don't, if you see the munkar and it doesn't burn you inside. If you're a true believer, you're somebody who truly loves Allah and loves the Messenger, you're a Muslim who truly loves Islam. When you see munkar, it has to kill you inside. You see a woman not wearing proper hijab, you say, I will inside, it, it, it eats you up. You see a brother who's doing something that's haram, dealing in haram, it eats you up. You see a brother, like in this story with a golden ring, you hate it inside. This is how, if it becomes normal, adi, it's no big deal, no hijab. Okay, you have to really check out your iman. You have a serious weakness in your iman. You have a serious problem. If you see that munkir and it doesn't eat you up inside, you have to see that munkir, you have to hate it. That's the lowest level of iman. And if you have the ability, and, and like I said, with the tongue, it could be something. So I was with one of the brothers one time, and we we're walking, and we see a sister not wearing ha- proper hijab. We don't know her, she doesn't know us. We're walking in the street. He says, Salam alaikum, ukhti. Salam alaikum, my sister. He said, Al hijab wajib. Hijab is fart. Or he just walked past her, we say, Al hijab wajib. The hijab is fart. Hijab is compulsory. She can take it, she can accept it, she can reject it, she can tell you to go. You know, this, alhamdulillah, we've done our job. We've, we, we, we're ordered as an ummah to go out and make inkar of the munkar. Allah ordered us in the Quran. We know from the sunnah. So we advise. And if they accept it, alhamdulillah, but we've done our job. And when that is spread and people are constantly advising, you're going to find more and more people are going to have shame. And why do people not have shame when they do the haram openly now? Because nobody says anything to them. So we're the ones who destroyed the ummah with ourselves by not making inkar of the munkar. And we have an amazing story we're going to share with you about that. But we're going to do it, inshallah ta'ala, in the beginning of the next episode, inshallah ta'ala, because we're out of time. Until next time, Allah knows best. Allahu alam wa sallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Nabi Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Allah's chosen one. The chosen one to spread the truth. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The chosen one, though the road is long. Just know Allah won't let you lose your way. You are.